I'm Kailani, and this is The Kai Report, where I uncover the truths about music and music education. Today, we'll be hanging out with Dr. Glenda Bates. Uh, Hello! Glenda, if you want to introduce yourself. Sure! So, my name's Glenda. Um, I'm a stage one professor at Oaklef, so that means I teach the beginning students, some of which have had no piano experience before, or some of which have maybe taken a little bit of lessons in the traditional once a week setting and want to try out our Oaklef daily method. Um, I come to Oaklef in a little bit of a different route because my primary instrument as a performer is actually oboe, but I've played piano ever since I was a little kid like many musicians have. <laughs> um, yeah, and outside of teaching, I also freelance in the Bay Area, so I play with groups like um, California Box Society, and this weekend I'll be playing with Mills Performance Group in their last concert because Mills College got bought by Northeastern, so hopefully it stays on just in a new name. Uh, yeah, stuff like that. <laughs> wow, that's awesome. Yeah, so what made you want to pursue music? Um, it's, it's a good question because I think it was just always a part of my life. And at some point it became the main part, but it was always there. Like when I grew up, I sang in choir in my, my church's psalm singers, which is like five-year-olds to eight-year-olds, which is as, as adorable <laughs> as it sounds. <laughs> um, so I grew up singing and taking piano lessons and as soon as I was old enough, I started taking violin lessons and flute lessons. Um, and I was always interested in music theater and I took ballet and tap. So I was I was coming at music from all these different sides. Um, and at one point I switched to oboe. And, you know, the older you get in school, the more you have to kind of funnel your interests in a way like there weren't enough classes for me to take choir and orchestra and drama and band. So I had to sort of pick one. <laughs> um, and music always seemed to win out. And then oboe started always winning out. Um, but it was funny because even when I went to college, I wasn't sure that music was what I wanted to do professionally. I knew, I think mostly because I didn't know what that entailed. I couldn't imagine it because I hadn't known any professional musicians growing up. Um, so I was actually an undeclared major. And then at the last minute, I kind of decided, eh, I'll be a music major and take those courses. And then I can always change it later once I figure it out. But then I really enjoyed like learning music theory and music history and all this stuff that I had never been exposed to before college. I got really fascinated by it. So I just stuck with it. <laughs> wow. That's a lot of music. <laughs> It is a lot, yeah. <laughs> I can still sing show tunes and tap dance uh, in oh. my living room. So, <laughs> so cute. <laughs> oh, it's so cute. Yeah, so speaking of school, so yeah. where did you go to school? And did you have a plan for going into music education at that point? Um, I didn't. I So I went to University of South Carolina for my undergrad. And I was a bachelor of music because I still wasn't sure. I was like, I don't think I want to be a band director and being a performer feels really hard. I still kind of just wasn't sure what I wanted to do. Um, I thought I might go into like musicology or ethnomusicology, but then my senior year, I really decided, no, I want to stick it out with performance. So then I started applying to grad school for performance and I went to University of Maryland um, to get my master's of um, Masters of Music and Oboe Performance and then I went to Stony Brook University for my Doctorate of Musical Arts in Oboe Performance. Um, yeah, so that's where I went. Um, I studied with some really awesome oboe teachers and awesome history teachers along the way, so yeah. After all that performance, um, how did you find your way to music education? Well, that's a good question. I... I have always enjoyed teaching ever since I was, even when I was in elementary school as like a sixth grader, I was teaching like a third grader how to play the oboe because <laughs> she was too young to join band, but she really wanted to play oboe. And her mom was like, you play oboe, why don't you teach her? So that was my first student. And and all along the way, I've been teaching students here and there. Um, let's see. So after, after I moved out to California, which was when I was still, I was like all but dissertation status with my doctorate degree. I moved out to California and started 
getting some training in um, what it is to be a teaching artist, which is a term I hadn't heard before, which is like an an artist who also teaches. So you're trained in the in the uh -huh. art form more so than you're trained in education, although you're kind of trained in both. So we were we got training on how to do um, interactive performances, which I really liked. And I started teaching. I was I was being housed up in Angwin, which is where Pacific Union College is. I was here for like a one year period um, and I'm still here. So uh, that was nine years ago. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but I, the college there just so happened to need a jazz ensemble director because the person they had lined up last minute was going to be going on tour. And they saw they saw in my resume that I had studied jazz and played in some jazz groups. And they were like, would you be our jazz teacher? And so <laughs> it just sort of happened, just kind of like how life is. I don't know that I intended to be a teacher. I was just kind of open to options of what might happen. I was also taking a lot of auditions at the time. And I was applying for like full-time professor jobs at various universities. Um, but I ended up uh, teaching at that college and also teaching in a few of the local schools. They were starting, they called it the Heartstrings Youth Academy program um, at Napa. It was called Napa Junction elementary school. I think the name might have changed. I'll have to double check the name for you guys. But uh, I was teaching there actually violin and flute and trumpet because there were no oboe players. Uh, <laughs> um, it's a kind of a long journey. And then I've always really enjoyed working with little kids. And so during this one year program that I did up in Napa Valley, I also had the experience of working with a preschool, going in twice a week and mm. working with the teacher to develop a curriculum that would work well for their students. And I started to really love doing that. And so I, I worked then for performing arts workshop in San Francisco for about wow. five years doing that i would um i had artist residencies at various preschools all over the city so they would set me up with one school for 10 weeks i would meet with their teachers we would decide on a little program and we would do it and i did that continuously at different schools throughout the year um, and it was all preschool some kindergarten some first grade but mostly really young age um, and then when i moved to oakland that's when i really started playing teaching piano more i've always played piano especially to write, um, to learn songs and write songs as a singer. I, it's just such a useful tool for that. And um, I started finding piano students and teaching at a school in my neighborhood. And then that's what led me eventually to Oak Club. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's incredible. So it was really just like fate then. <laughs> yeah, I don't know that I ever thought like, oh, I'm gonna be a teaching artist. I mean, I never knew what a teaching artist was until I moved here and then moved here meaning to California and was part of this program that through Napa Symphony. Um, but I just, I really enjoyed doing that work, yeah. Yeah, so so right before Oak Cliff then, you were working for the studio and then you had some of your own students? Exactly, yeah. I was actually working for two different music academies, one in Redwood City, at which I had to drive to from Oakland and one in my neighborhood in Oakland that I could walk to. And then I also had my own students, so, if counting my own company, I was working for three different studios at the same time, which was a lot juggling schedules, but um, yeah. that's just how it goes sometimes as a freelancer. So, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, oh my goodness, that's a lot of balance and just like managing your time and stuff. So yeah. I guess like ultimately, were you satisfied with like how things were or? With the teaching situation? kind of both. I mean, I was happy to be teaching and I enjoy working with children, but um, being a contract freelancer is is just sort of inherently unstable. And so there's always the worry of like, oh, well, what if three of my students move away? Like, that's going to be a large portion of my income or, or you know, every summer rolls around then I like students drop in half for the summer and then hopefully come back in the fall. There's just a lot of sort of unknowns when you're teaching contract based that way. Um, but I did enjoy working with all the students. And I mean, that's the best part is just getting to know the students and getting to know their families and helping them figure out what they want to do with music. And, yeah. yeah. 
So speaking of like unknowns and just unprecedented stuff, so when COVID-19 hit, like how did that affect you and your situation? So I immediately moved all of my piano lessons online, um, which actually worked well. I was one of those people prior to the pandemic that was like, online lessons can't be nearly as effective as in person. This is ridiculous, (laughs) but I'm totally sold on it now. I... Um, so sold that I started looking for a job that would be exclusively online because I enjoy the flexibility of being remote. Um, and so, yeah, I felt really lucky actually sometimes as a performer, you know, we're always like comparing ourselves to other people, even though we know that mentally that's not healthy. (laughs) It just happens. And I've always, I was always a little bit jealous of the people that can, that were making money a hundred percent from performing and weren't also teaching because I'd be like, well, I want to, I want to play oboe full time, you know? Um, But then when the pandemic hit, I felt really lucky because my, all of my performance income just disappeared overnight while all of my teaching income remained steady because we just moved online and kept on going. So I was really grateful for that. (laughs) Yeah, I see. Yeah, that's awesome. I know. Like, I'm I'm really glad that it worked out at least. (laughs) Yeah, me too. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. What stood out most to you about Oak Clef that was kind of just different from what you were already doing? Well, the main thing is the piano everyday model, which is just, um, I, I haven't seen it anywhere else. And it's something that I had been thinking about a lot as a teacher because uh, the main problem is is the, the practice problem, right? If you're seeing a student only once a week, They might actually only be playing the piano once a week. They might not be practicing at all in between, or they might be just kind of noodling around and they say, well, I, you know, I played the piano for 10 minutes every day, but they're, you know, they don't quite know how to practice or what, what it means to practice versus just kind of noodling around. Or in some cases I would have um, students who came back being able to play a piece perfectly, but then I kind of realized that they're not actually reading it someone had just taught it to them and they memorized it and so Mm -hmm. of course I'm really trying to work on note reading and and that would kind of counteract that so there was there's a lot of issues that come up with only having lessons once a week and that was the main attraction to me for OCLEF was that they stage one students have a one-on-one 15-minute lesson every day and then the upper level students also have some sort of piano class or practice session or lesson or something every day um i just thought that that was a really smart solution to the to the practice problem as i've heard it called in piano blogs various places <laughs> <laughs> yeah i felt really lucky to find oclef it was like exactly what i was looking for i wanted to keep teaching and and keep being a part of music but i wanted a more stable like full-time job um which is unheard of out in in a music studio. I've never heard of a piano school offering people full-time salary jobs. I've literally never heard of that. So I think it's pretty revolutionary, actually. Um, Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, that's awesome. So overall, just like as far as teaching goes, so has it changed for you ever since you started working at Oak Yeah, my approach has changed. Um... I think knowing that you're going to see a student the very next day, just we have just like a small goal every day to accomplish. Like we're kind of sight reading music or maybe today we're going to learn rhythm if it's a brand new student. Um, Knowing that if I don't get all the way through an explanation of something before the time gets cut off, I'm I'm just going to see them again tomorrow. I'm not going to have to wait a whole week and then start my whole explanation over because we don't remember what happened last (laughs) week. And um, it's just it's just more continuous. And so I feel like I, I think students can actually progress more quickly through things because they're they're doing it a little bit every day. I always like to think of it relating it to like learning language or math, like. If you're learning, if you're like trying to learn Italian and you only have a class once a week, it's going to take you years to learn Italian. But if you had met with a a teacher once a day and just like talked in Italian with them every day, maybe it'll only take one year, you know? (laughs) So um, I like to think of it that way. You can just keep it going and it's more fluid. Um, Mm -hmm. And I also 
get to know the students because I see them every day. You know, I hear what they're doing and um, yeah. I, I The main thing that's also changed is um, using our intervallic approach um, where we, instead of focusing right away on like, oh, this is C and this is D and this is E, we focus on like finding the starting note and reading the steps and skips up and down and the fourths and fifths up and down and not because I feel like that sort of memorizing the notes on the staff is really stressful for for a lot of students for some students it clicks right away and for others it's really stressful so just kind of releasing that and thinking like okay we'll get to that eventually but let's just look for patterns and follow the patterns because that's what music's all about really reading music was probably the hardest part out of everything that I had to yeah. do like something about it and it's just memorizing like all the placements and then even like the whole concept of ledger lines later on I was like what there are so many notes how do they all fit <laughs> into this ginormous chart with lines and yeah it was so complicated but yeah I know like I really like looking back I really wished that I would have had something as like structured and pattern based because it's like especially with kids like when they're just growing up they're not really um how do i say this it's like they're not really exposed to a lot of things but the main thing like when you're a child is okay like patterns like apple banana apple banana exactly. <laughs> that whole thing and they get kids are excited about patterns yeah like when when a student notices a pattern in a sight reading exercise they they get really excited about it. they're like oh man measure one is the same as measure two but it starts on a different note and you're like exactly <laughs> and so it's nice to see those little moments of clicking whereas if they were really focused on like oh that's an e okay e and like oh, that's an f they might not have noticed the bigger picture if they were really zoned in on each note in the beginning so yeah i think it's definitely a lot more efficient and it just it saves time overall and just it keeps things interesting yeah I agree. Last but not least, my final question. <laughs> <laughs> so personally, so what opportunities has Oak Cliff given you now? Well, opportunities, let's see. There's lots of creative opportunities. Like I'm working for the Diaglev subsidiary where we're writing music. And actually, this is my first time writing like 100% electronics based music. When I've composed in the past, it's been like for acoustic instruments where I write the score and then people play it. And so I'm kind of like reorganizing my brain to like, oh, the, the electronics part is the main part and like learning how to compose in this way. And that's pretty fun. Um, but there's also just opportunities to do different kinds of creative projects like this Kai report, for example. Um, <laughs> and I've it, it kind of is like because it's a full time job, it allows my brain to be more creative because when you're not stressing out about like oh what's my is, next week is a light week it's gonna be a light check oh no what am I gonna do like it allows your brain to like fill in that worry with like creative projects instead <laughs> which um there are like studies that prove that that like if your mind is consumed with anxiety and stress like it just doesn't have space to be artistic and be creative so I think that's a really important thing for for artists and teachers um I really like writing children's music and um, writing like educational exercises, like maybe what will eventually be a method book of some kind. So with mm -hmm. the time in between lessons, I'm often thinking about like, what little exercise could I write that would help this student overcome this like note reading challenge that they're having and being able to just write it down yeah. and have a little collection of things going. I think it's really great that they have these opportunities because like as a college student, there's only so much I can dedicate my time to and stuff. But the fact that I can not only teach, but I can also learn how to record and produce a video of some sort or learn how to make transcriptions and video edit, sound edit. It's like, it's a lot in one. And I think it's really beneficial for those who happen to cross Oak Cliff. <laughs> yes, I think so. Yeah. Oh, and then um, I just realized I forgot this. So what had happened um, with your other students? So I know you mentioned you were teaching privately. So oh, yeah. What happened with that? Most of the students from the academies that I taught at, they they stayed on at those academies with different teachers. But some of the students actually some have followed me 
to Oak Cliff. They thought, no, we, you know, we don't want to leave oh. you as a teacher. Can we come to Oak Cliff? And I said, sure, <laughs> of course. And a few, a few of my private students followed me to Oak Cliff as well. And so they're really enjoying this daily method. Um, it's really helpful because some of those students I was having this sort of like practice problem with where I wasn't sure if they were practicing mm -hmm. or or maybe their parent was just kind of like showing them how to play it rather than helping them read how to play mm -hmm. it. And so just ha seeing them every day has has really helped with those students. I see. And then like transition wise, was it difficult or was it? Um, for, for <laughs> I think it was. Um, difficult conceptually because they were like every day isn't that a lot and I'm like well but it's only 15 minutes a day and you don't have to practice on your own and they're like oh okay I'm sold you know <laughs> because because <laughs> parents feel the struggle too you know they want their kids to practice and I was one of those kids growing up my mom used to have to like you know threaten me in order to get me to <laughs> and I didn't like my piano lessons growing up and so that's always been my goal is to like you know students need to enjoy their piano lessons first of all otherwise they're never going to get anywhere um but also you can't you can't like the practice battle is a losing battle unless you're seeing them every day. And so yeah. Oak Cliff just sort of takes um takes up that slack and saying, well, we, I can see that you didn't practice because you didn't log in yesterday, you know, so it kind of keeps students in check that might try to get out of practicing. But it also encourages students to want to practice because they have a guide there to help them they're not sitting at the piano and thinking well, i don't know how to do this what am i supposed to do by myself if i don't understand it you know so that just yeah. helps a lot yeah i definitely think like as far as accountability it makes things a whole lot easier <laughs> yes that's the word i was looking for accountability yes it just like um, provides that element so that it's not like a in a, a struggle with family members or with the teacher and it's just it's all right there in the attendance and just engaging daily with the teacher yeah all righty well i think that's a perfect spot to end this interview so thank you so much for talking with me dr glenda and i am super excited to share your story Yay. on the chi report so thanks for listening Yay, everyone and that is a wrap for today's chi report <laughs>